Hello everyone, we've got a new batch of giants to explore. Back in the day these megalomaniacal cases meant that you had a serious machine. And for that reason I have no doubt we're going to find some treasures within their cavernous cases. So let's get these torn apart and find out. It is so hard to get this giant thing in frame. I was forced to tidy up the edges of the bench that are normally out of frame. We'll see how well I stick to that through the course of the video. And we have a badge here, either Zenon or Zenon. Pick your favorite. I've never heard of that. Perhaps someone has. This translucent window makes visible the LEDs and such things that are behind it. Speaking of which, let's see what's behind door number one. Yeah, we got a seven segment display. My favorite. Also have our power, turbo, and hard drive LEDs. Our reset and turbo buttons. Got an old school tape drive here. I love how it has an LED in the style of the old MFM drives. And of course, got our CD-ROM here, looking kind of out of place amongst all the gray. Got our five and a quarter inch floppy drive and our three and a half inch floppy drive. And this here is one of those silly drive blank covers that looks like a floppy drive. It was always pretty funny watching people try to put discs inside of those. <laughs> and here's our power switch. You know, something tells me that may not be the right power supply for this case. Just a hunch. This tower is actually supposed to have one of these old AT style power supplies, but hey, whatever works. I don't judge. And way down below we have a very nice complement of ports and peripheral cards. Got our parallel port here, our 9 and 25 pin serial ports, the AT style keyboard connector of course. I'm guessing this parallel port card got relocated up here for some unknown reason. Got some kind of sound card, looks like a later one. And we got some SCSI action here, so we may find some SCSI hard drives in there. And we got some kind of video card with S-Video and composite outputs, and a NIC. Alright, let's get this beastly thing open. And despite the enormous stature of this thing, it still opens up just like any old AT case. So I need to be careful not to hit my shop lights with it. Let's see how that goes. Well, that was close. Ew, found the insect graveyard. They've been in there for a while. And we have not one but two SCSI hard drives. That one is thick. I bet it makes some lovely sounds. A little bit concerned that it's disconnected though. Hopefully that doesn't mean bad things. <laughs> this is funny. There's so much space between the power supply and the motherboard that they had to use these extension cables. <laughs> I just love it. And quite a few things have these price stickers on them. Mostly related to the power supply. Here's another one. And another one. And another one. And we got a Socket 7 motherboard. Looks like a Pentium chip on there. And this is one of those PC chips motherboards with the fake cache chips on them. That is too funny. I had a system just last week with one of these motherboards in it. Yeah, funny story. They ship these motherboards with these dummy cache chips on them. They don't actually do anything. They don't even have traces running to most of the pins, so you can't just solder on real cache chips either. It's very strange. And we don't even have a cache on a stick module to compensate for it either. I feel like this system was probably built down to a price or at least upgraded on a shoestring budget. The tape drive is scuzzy, of course, and it's disconnected, so they probably stopped using it a long time ago. All right, let's start getting stuff disconnected. There's nothing worse than a Molex connector that's been stuck in place for nearly 30 years. Okay, let's start with that sound card. And that's a creative card. Looks like it's from the post Isonic acquisition era, CT4810 from 1999. Now let's see that SCSI card. Looking pretty SCSI. Here's a good shot of that chipset. Does that chipset say tolerant? Either way, it's made by NCR, 53Z810. Always good to have these around. Now let's see that video card. Oh, it's got the VRAM expansion card. Very nice. And that's an ATI 3D Rage Pro from 1997. Things loaded with VRAM. Very nice. And finally, the NIC. And it's made by Netgear and is Novell Netware approved. That must be the MAC address there. Always good to have an ISA NIC around. 
And that heatsink is stuck fast to the CPU, so we're not gonna know exactly what it is, but I can almost guarantee it's a Pentium 1. Let's get it out of there. <laughs> what is that? CPU cool. Well, that's cool. Hey, they got this thing on sale. And all the pins look good. Let's get that out of there. A lot of those capacitors aren't looking too hot. When the shrink wrap is peeled back like that, it's sometimes an indicator that they've been exposed to heat for a long time. It doesn't necessarily mean they're bad, but it's definitely suspect. And with this motherboard manufacturer scamming people out of their cash chips, I'm fairly certain they weren't using high quality caps either. Fortunately, none of them appear to have leaked. Now let's check out that RAM. Quite a lot of chips on there. I can't tell what size it is, but it could be a big one. Let's check out the next one. That appears to be an identical stick, just with LGS instead of Siemens chips up top. We'll have to see what it counts up to. So this is a different revision of the motherboard that I pulled last week. That one had a CR2032 battery there, whereas this one has a Dallas RTC. I wonder if this board could be converted easily, just by swapping the RTC chip and installing a battery holder there. If you don't know, these Dallas RTC modules contain an internal battery, and with the year marked as 1995, that battery is certainly dead. So we're probably gonna have to do the battery hack. Now let's pull these drives. Looks like I can pull this entire lower drive cage. Let's see. Yep, nice and easy. And now I can get a good shot of those fake cash chips. And here's the first hard drive. This is the skinnier one of the two, the one that was connected. It's a Micropolis 4421. Doesn't say what its capacity is, but the Google says it's probably about two gigabytes. And here's a shot of the logic board of that drive. And check this out. Look at the way they bodged in that SMD component. They just glued it on the top of that chip. <laughs> that is too funny. I've always wondered about bodges like that. Wow, they really had someone taking the care to do that on every board before the next revision. And that is some fine pitch soldering where it attaches to that Q-Logic chip. And here's the thick boy. It's a Toshiba MK538FB. No indication of capacity on this one either. But according to the Google, looks like it could be 1.2 gigabytes. And here's a shot of that logic board. Sure hope this thing works. I'm dying to know how it sounds. And the three and a half inch floppy drive is made by TIAC, model FD235HF. It is very lightweight. Feels almost cheap. That's very strange for a TIAC drive. And that bearing doesn't sound too good either. But at least it spins. Death to warranties. I might as well just peel that one off. Okay, we're decently clean in here. Let's just go over those heads. Not bad, not bad. Let's clean the old grease off that lead screw. Now let's get some new grease on there. And the five and a quarter inch drive is an Epson SD600. And it looks pretty clean as well, just very minimally dusty. And most of that I can just get with a microfiber cloth. Now let's get that cover off and give it some service. Now let's go ahead and clean those heads. Yeah, those are a little bit dirty. Let's actually go over those again. There, that's better. No trouble out of that spindle. And the CD-ROM drive is made by Light On, model LTN242. Overall, it's a pretty clean looking drive. Man, that tape drive looks sick. It just looks so beefy and spartan. Yeah, check out that read right head. That thing's chonky. Unfortunately, it looks like that roller is perished. Yeah, that would fall apart if you breathe on it wrong. So even if I had the tapes, I wouldn't be able to test this thing, unfortunately. But that belt still has plenty of traction. Here's a look at the underside of it. That motor is just massive. Like this is a five and a quarter inch drive and this motor takes up nearly a third of it. And it's made by Archive Corporation, model 2150S. And it draws 2.5 amps on the 12 volt rail. This little thing's hungry. And can we just stop and admire the fact that this power supply is held in with a single screw? And also the blockage of a quarter of that fan is an especially nice touch. This is what getting it done looks like. And this power supply does not instill confidence. The weight of a power supply is generally a pretty reliable indicator of its quality. And there is not very much gravity in this thing. 
It's also got that quintessential flimsy sheet metal construction. Feels like you can just crumple it up. So let's take it apart and see how bad it is. And before I do that, let me just point out the reason why these people are screaming at you with this warning. Power supplies are very dangerous. And you can easily hurt yourself if you mess around with one and you don't really know what you're doing. So unless you've done it many times before, I advise you to avoid such things. And if it's your first time, just be incredibly careful. Don't touch circuit boards, don't touch heat sinks. There are a lot of things inside of a power supply that really want to kill you. Just don't touch the circuit board at all until you've learned how to discharge things. Ah, time to wreck warranty number two. And that is one teeny tiny transformer. And this board still has flux all over it. Clearly wasn't cleaned after manufacturing. And I see a rogue solder ball there. That's not something you want bouncing around inside a power supply. Honestly, I can't get over how small that transformer is. I put a CR2032 battery on it for scale. You can barely see that little thing under there. Uh-huh, 250 watts? Sure, I believe that. Let's find out just how much it can handle. I'm gonna start us off with just one 60 watt light bulb, as well as the sacrificial hard drives, of course. Let's see what happens. <laughs> it is not happy about that at all. Look at that 12 volt rail. Yeah, that power supply is junk. Can't even handle a quarter of its rated capacity. Okay, I wanna see some smoke though. Let's see how long it will run. It just sounds like it's struggling. I decided I might as well get the meter back on it, and we're down to just under eight volts. And I hear that fan getting slower and slower. And the fact that this is going on means this power supply doesn't have very much in the way of protection circuitry, which is even more reason to not use it. All right, this is taking too long. Let's add another light bulb. Here goes 120 watts. And it doesn't even start. I guess it does have some protection circuitry. I guess we'll just see how long it lives with a single bulb. Those heat sinks are looking awfully toasty. It's starting to smell like roasted transformer in here. We're about 10 minutes in. Almost 200 degrees now on that heat sink. Well, it's been about 20 minutes now. And while the thing is pretty good at suffering, I don't think we're gonna get catastrophic failure. Boring. I knew this thing was full of lies. Only good for spare parts. Into the scrap pile it goes. Well, that gives me a chance to put this new old stock power supply to work. I found this at a garage sale a couple blocks away. It's a bit of a time capsule. Still has a user manual there from 1991. And it's still wrapped in its plastic. Let's just get that out of there. And it does actually seem like a pretty high quality power supply. I have already tested it. Works just fine. It's definitely never been used. There is not a speck of dust anywhere. And it even comes with a warranty. Can't beat that. We also have the original factory test sheet. I found that pretty interesting. And here's what it looks like with the correct power supply installed. It fits perfectly, and there's no longer a need for those extension cables for motherboard power. Now it's time to hack that RTC. Now sometimes these are very hatefully soldered to the motherboard, requiring you to desolder them. But fortunately, this one is socketed, so we can just pull it right out. Now, I know I go into detail every time I encounter this on the channel, but that's just for the sake of the people who've never seen it before. This hack involves drilling two holes in the side of the module to access the internal battery terminals. After that, you simply solder on an external battery. So first, you have to find pins 16 and 20, and this dot here indicates pin 1. So all you do is count 12 pins this way, then you come over to the other side of the chip, you go 13, 14, 15, 16, and you notice that pin 16 is missing. You also notice that pin 20 is missing, and that's the reason why you have to drill in. So just come over to that side of the module, take your favorite drill, and just drill a shallow hole. You don't have to drill very far, just until you hit metal. And once you can see a little bit of the terminal, that's all you need. Now let's get some flux on those terminals. Now we'll tin them up with solder. Now I can go ahead and solder on the leads for our external battery, with the negative being pin 16. Now we already know the module's battery is dead, but let's find out how dead. Half a volt. Honestly, I'm pretty surprised it has that much even, after almost 30 years. That battery is supposed to be 3 volts. Now let's get that flux cleaned off with IPA. Do you have to use flux? No, not really. But you will thank yourself. Most solder is already infused with flux. 
but adding extra just makes it that much easier. Then once all your hackulation is complete, just hot glue everything together and you're done. Now let's take a look at that CPU fan. It seems okay, bearing wise. Let's see what it sounds like. Okay, actually sounds great. So all it needs is dust removal, which means I need to figure out how to get it off of there. Let's try one of these little numbers. Okay, that wasn't so bad. And I'll just sweep that out with a paintbrush. That'll do it. All right, it's my favorite time. Testing time. Let's see what this thing does. Okay, well our seven segment display works. However, not much else. We have no post and no beeps either. All right, time to go into diagnostic mode. The first step in that is to strip the machine down to minimums. That is to say, strip everything that's not essential for the machine to run. In this case, everything except the CPU, memory, and video card. There's no telling which component is faulty, so removing all the extra stuff helps narrow it down. All right, that's done. Let's try again. Aha, now we're posting. Okay, so the system is clearly unhappy with one of those components that we removed. So let's just put them back one by one until the problem returns, and that should reveal our culprit. I have a sneaking suspicion that it's the SCSI card. It could just be down to a dirty edge connector or something. Okay, the sound card's innocent. The NIC is also innocent. It's down to the SCSI card. I sure hope this card isn't bad. Let's just try it without the drive connected first. Okay. That's better. Well, let's get that drive connected. Okay, I also have the CD and floppy drives reconnected since they're very unlikely to be the problem. Got the SCSI drive reconnected, so let's see. And yeah, post is fine. Okay, so I have no idea what the problem was. Probably just a dirty connector somewhere. And the action of inserting and removing it just straightened it out. Okay, well, let's try to continue testing. Okay, once again, Let's go in the setup and see what it thinks of things. Let's go ahead and add our drive B. Let's go ahead and save that. And our SCSI drive detected. And it's booting. They got Windows 98 on that thing? That's funny. I was expecting like something more servery. Wow, they were really proud of that Windows 98 install. Okay, so I'm not even going to blur that name because I'm pretty sure it's fake. And it's kind of funny. Will be done. What will be done? Let's find out. We don't need no password in Windows 98. Uh-oh. Not Win9x plug and play. We may not get out of this one alive. Oh, a hard drive sounds fun. Aw, we didn't get a startup sound. wonder if our sound driver got lost to the ages. 1998 TurboTax Deluxe. Now that's a time capsule. I'm not getting great results with this serial mouse. I don't know what's going on here. It moves just barely. Serial mouse is our only option on this machine. Okay, here we go. That's getting better. Still not exactly responsive. <laughs> wow, real player. Gotta open that up. And they never registered it. Sure, we'll do that. Quit configuration. Wow, look how cutting edge. Offering 36 full-length CDs. Wow, can't beat that. We better upgrade soon. Yeah, that sound card's not having a good time. Oh well. Jeez, look at that interface. It's just cycling through some ad text or something. Brent Musburger. That might be able to date that. I'm wondering how old this data is. South Park, The Daily Show, and more. That's that very old Comedy Central logo. Definitely 90s. And the Excite Toolbar. Oh, the memories. Let's see what happens when I click on one of these. Probably just brings up the browser. Oh no, it's trying to connect to something, obviously, and that's unable to. Wow, so they were really using Prodigy. What else were they using? Just Prodigy. Okay, obviously we're not getting into there. Aw, oh, we can't connect. Alright, let's get out of here. Let's see what else is on here. Lots of documents. Some of which look sketchy. Let's see what programs we have. This looks like an office slash entertainment computer. Or mild entertainment. I don't see any games. What is Howdy? Okay, it's not a program apparently. 
Microsoft Year 2000 Product Analyzer. Oh yeah, we found some Y2K paraphernalia. Let's open that up. Aw, it's gone. It's probably on the other hard drive. Yeah, that ain't happening. Cancel. What else is in there? Let's see what version of Word that is. Word 2000, and it's fully licensed. Oh, Clippy! A perfectly preserved Clippy. All right, let's get out of here. Let's check out those drives. Why is C drive shared? The system may have been from an office. And D drive is shared too, but that's most likely that other drive. Because they certainly wouldn't be sharing the CD drive. Well, let's see if that three and a half inch floppy drive works. And yep, sure does. Good old TAC. All right, how about the big guy? And that works too. Awesome. Let's give them both a little workout. Let's copy something from one to the other. Let's see how much free space. We've got 148k free on that disk. So let's copy something that's about that size from A drive. Scandisk.exe looks like the one. All right, that worked. Got two healthy floppy drives. All right, how about the CD drive? And it's stuck. No surprise. Probably has a perished belt. Let's see if we can help it out. Well, I see the belt in there. It looks okay. I guess things are just a little sticky. Given enough time, grease will turn to glue. Well, we don't seem too happy. At least we didn't get the label change. Let's see if we can explore. Yeah, that drive's not happy. Okay, well, I'll explore that later. Let's try to get that other SCSI drive working. Let's get you plugged in. All right, let's find out. Well, it doesn't sound entirely healthy, but it's detected. Okay, we have a fixed disk as the D drive now. Does it work? Yes, it does. And it's slam full of tax documents, apparently. Let me see, did I read that right? I thought it said it had a couple of 100 kilobytes free space. Yeah, 192 kilobytes free. They used every bit of that drive. I wonder why it was disconnected. It doesn't seem like it's bad. Well, let's see if we can figure out when the last time this computer was used. Let's jump in these documents. We got a date stamp of 9-17-98 on that. Go into detail mode. We're up to August 1999. And man, this thing has a lot of documents on it. I'm gonna have to wipe this drive twice. Let's get out of here. Let's see if we can find that Y2K program now. Nope, still not happening. Let's get out of here. Okay, I really wanna hear that D drive work. It seems like it sounds lovely. So let's try copying these documents over to C drive. Both drives are getting wiped anyway. Well, C drive's about full too. 234 megabytes left. I guess we'll fill it up. Ooh, yeah, that thing sounds crunchy. It is running awfully slow for a SCSI drive. Yeah, that thing's running awfully slow. These documents can't possibly be that big. Let's cancel that. Let's try to run some benchmarks on these drives. Yeah, who would I be if I didn't try to run SpeedSys on SCSI drives? And we are performing like a regular old Pentium 133. With that motherboard's fake cache being painfully obvious. But we are here for hard drive tests. Let's start with C drive. Oh, that sounds awesome. All right, that took forever. But here's our results. Definitely not running at peak performance. Let's check the D drive. Thing sounds like a single engine Cessna. Yeah, these drives should be performing a lot better. All right, there's the results for that one. Well, let's run scan disk over them and see what condition they're in. <laughs> wow, that thing is a bloodbath. Well, no wonder we're performing so terribly. That thing really mostly bad sectors. I'm impressed that thing booted Windows at all. Let's see if it finds any new ones. 
Okay, well, there's no new ones, at least. I'm tempted to try to format it to see what happens. But first, let's look at the D drive. Huh, interesting. I wonder why. That is what that drive got assigned, right? No, I guess not. What the devil is going on? Let's see. Change current drive. Well, it sees it. It's not assigned a letter, though. Well, that is weird. Oh, right, that drive must have a FAT32 partition on it. That is not supported under this version of DOS. So I'm on a DOS 622 boot disk, because SpeedSys doesn't always play nice with Windows 98 DOS mode. Well, let's get back up to Windows and get in DOS mode and see what that says. I like how it drops me in a Windows 95 directory. <laughs> Okay, yeah, C drive looks fine, at least to start out with. Okay, so we figured out why the Toshiba drive was disconnected. Okay, yeah, looks like that drive is fine. So I unfairly sullied the good name of Micropolis. Okay, well, at least we have one good SCSI hard drive. Well, you know what? We have nothing to lose. Let's format that D drive. This could take a while. Let's give it a name. Yeah, that drive is truly wrecked. It is interesting that I can get in that bad a condition and still sound fine. Okay, let's clean this thing up. Overall, it's in pretty good condition. It just has a lot of tape residue on it. And the reason for that is the little plastic latch that keeps this thing closed is gone. It uses one of these little push-in, push-out mechanisms. No idea what they're actually called. So I'll have to think of some kind of solution which doesn't involve magnets, because magnets near disk drives is no bueno. All right, I'm gonna go straight to IPA for this tape residue. And IPA made short work of that, and Windex should be able to handle the rest. It also gets rid of that white residue that the alcohol leaves behind. Now let's see how visible those LEDs are through that panel. This case is cool. And of course, since we don't have turbo functionality on this motherboard, we don't get the digit switching. And the sides of the case are in pretty good condition, though we do have some scratches on the left side. Yeah, this is overall a pretty nice case. Still has all that retro character. I wouldn't keep that motherboard in here though. I would like one with actual turbo functionality. And hey, at least we got one SCSI hard drive out of the deal. Maybe I'll turn that Toshiba drive into a noise maker or something. Or maybe I'll see if something like Spinrite can straighten it out. With that many bad sectors though, it looks pretty hopeless. Let's move on to the next system. Now we're really looking retro enterprise grade. This thing has server written all over it. No, seriously, it has server written on it. Got a Windows 2000 server COA sticker there. It also has these plastic feet that flip out on each side just for extra stability. And can you believe we actually still have the keys? That's almost unheard of. And the system is made by a company called HIQ. This company seems to be still around, though I'm not completely sure if it's the same company. There's a company based in Massachusetts that looks like it might be the same. We'll have to see if we find any corroborating evidence in this system to link the two. Now let's see what's behind door number two. Well, I sure hope that password was temporary. Yeah, this thing's looking even more servery with that tape drive there. Looks like we got quite a few hours on this thing. Lots of dust build up there. We got our power and reset buttons and LEDs here. And I love the fact that they're visible even with this door closed. You can see them right through that window. So thoughtful. And here's a look at the back of the machine. I see we have provisions for dual power supplies. I wonder if the motherboard supports that. Very nice. And we see it is an ATX system. Got an interesting looking video card there with RF output. I haven't seen that very often right on the video card. That's gonna be interesting. Now we've got our NIC here. Got a dial-up modem, an additional parallel port, no doubt used for a Sentinel key or something, and some extra USB ports. And here's some more HIQ info. This system was manufactured in May 2001. So this could be a Pentium 3 or early Pentium 4 board, unless it's been upgraded. Let's get this thing open and find out. You know the world in Super Mario 3 where everything's giant? That's what this feels like. This thing opens up like any other ATX case, except it's giant. Whoa, this thing has dual CPUs. They look like Pentium 3s. I see somebody deprived us of the hard drive. Well, at least they left the hard drive bracket in there. Let's get that out. So that slides up here, similar to the Enlight cases. Very convenient. Let's clear the rest of this out. Got our front mounted fan here. It's actually two front mounted fans. This thing had plenty of cooling. Let's just get this out for now. And boy, that IDE cable just barely fit there. <laughs> that thing's under tension. 
Let's get all these drives disconnected. And the CD audio cable runs to the video card. What a time to be alive. Now let's get these power cables out of here. Up out the way. All right, let's check out that crazy video card. And I gotta say, whoever came up with the idea to notch the case here to accommodate the screwdrive is an absolute scholar. That is top notch. And that is an ATI Rage Theater, obviously with a built-in TV tuner. I didn't even realize these existed. That thing's gotta be for both output and capturing. Got an HIQ warranty sticker there, so obviously original to the system, from the year 2000. Now let's check out that NIC. Pretty basic Intel NIC, 100 megabits of fury. Now let's check that dial-up modem. Got a 3COM modem with a Texas Instruments chipset, also an HIQ original. It's branded 3COM and US Robotics, 56K modem. Now let's check that parallel port card. It looks kind of funky. Yeah, that's an interesting little PCB from Lava Computers. It is also original to the system. It can join my other weirdly shaped parallel port card. And the only thing left is a breakout shield for the extra USB ports. Let's get that out of there. And that motherboard is made by Asus or Asus, whichever one you like. Model CUV4X-D. Seems to have plenty of coverage on the retro web, but we'll have to see if this BIOS version is still useful. I see this motherboard could have had onboard SCSI, but that is unfortunately not populated. Oh well. Let's check out those CPUs. Alright, got an Intel Pentium 3, and this heatsink is original to the system, with expertly applied thermal grease. That actually still seems to be in pretty good condition. Obviously I'm not going to reuse it, but just a note. Now let's check out CPU number two. Hmm, that RAM stick is right in my way. Let's get that out of there. And as expected, that's an identical Pentium 3. Very nice. Let's sweep some of that dust off so that it doesn't go down in the socket when I pull the CPU out. Let's do a pin check. I'm sure they're fine since I'm probably the first person to remove them. Yep, all looking good. Got another warranty sticker under there. Let's just put that back in. Let's check the other one. All good as well. Very nice. Now let's check out that RAM. The one I already took out is a 256 meg PC133 stick. It appears to be original to the system. Boy, they were serious about that warranty. They got stickers on both sides. Let's check out the next one. And that's an identical stick, bringing our total up to 512. Now let's check the last one. And we have a 256 meg stick of PC100, so 768 megs total. But with this stick being PC100, it's causing the PC133 sticks to downclock themselves, which is not ideal, but it works. This was obviously a later addition to the system, with the speed mismatch and missing warranty stickers. And this motherboard has an AGP Pro slot. AGP Pro is more for workstation machines. It delivers more power than standard AGP. And just so you know, this tab here is pretty important, because it prevents you from accidentally connecting the higher power rails to a standard AGP card, which would kill it of course, and probably wouldn't be great for the motherboard either. Alright, now it's time to pull these drives out. They appear to be on rails. You know, this thing is looking a lot like an Enlight case. I wonder if that's who actually manufactured this. It is pretty high quality. And that means the face is going to have to come off. Looks like removing six screws gets that done. So let's get those out. Okay, I removed the easily removable ones. But the two at the top are exceptionally difficult. Fortunately, these are spring washer things, so they're designed to be pulled out. So let's go ahead and pull them out. Yeah, there we go. I could have probably pulled it out with all of the screws in place, but... I always feel like I'm going to break stuff when I do that. Now let's get at those crusty, dusty drives. And that filthy floppy drive is a Mitsumi D359M3. Pretty common model. And judging by the outside, I think this thing's going to be a disaster inside. Let's wipe that off. Okay, I'm actually surprised it's not worse. 
We've just got a few little bunnies hiding here. This just needs very minimal sweep out. And you know the rest. And this tape drive is a disaster. The thing clearly has a lot of miles on it. And the belt is missing. Let's see what's going on beneath that logic board. Okay, not too bad, just dusty. This thing would probably work fine if it was cleaned up and had a belt, but I do not have a belt for it, so we won't be testing this one. And that CD-ROM drive is made by Delta, manufactured February 2001, and incredibly dusty. This system has the grimiest dust I've ever seen. Well, it doesn't clean off easily. I have a feeling this system was stored in a damp location. It doesn't look water damaged directly, but it just seems like it was exposed to humidity. Let's at least clean that label up. And hopefully this drive is like the floppy drive. Disgusting on the outside, but fairly clean on the inside. Alright, HIQ. It's time for me to scrutinize your choice of power supply. It has decent weight to it, so it's got that going for it at least. And there's the manufacturer's label. A maximum of 300 watts. We are definitely going to push that. But first, death to warranties. Well, it does have decent construction. However, this thing is pretty dirty. It's definitely had too much exposure to humidity. It just has that smell. Well, I don't know if I trust it, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to test it. I'm not going to pass up an opportunity for a smoke show. I got a single 60 watt bulb connected, as well as the usual sacrificial hard drives. Let's see what it does. Okay, it's handling it pretty well. Let's up the ante. Two 60 watt bulbs. Oh, it don't like that. Well, let's see if I can add it while it's already started. Nope. Shuts down instantly. I wonder if it's just that bulb. Let's see. Well, let's see if it dies with this single bulb. Yeah, it does. I guess this bulb is just too much for these power supplies. I'll take this one out of circulation. Let me go get another one. Okay, I found another bulb that doesn't trigger the short circuit protection. And I got two of those connected now, so one more time. Nope, still hates it. So the problem with testing with these bulbs is when the filament's cold, the resistance is really low. And that resistance does increase with temperature, but the initial low resistance is too much for these power supplies and triggers their short circuit protection. Well, let's just see how long it suffers with a single bulb. Okay, that's five minutes. Temps are perfectly fine. I say his power supply is good. It's just dirty. Now let's service these heat sinks. That's as clean as those are getting. Okay, let's see how they sound. I'd say that one's good. That one's a little bit noisier, but doesn't sound bearing related. Sounds like it's just off balance from dust. So let's get those cleaned up. I love using paintbrushes to clean heat sinks. The bristles reach all the way down. Done and done. All right, let's bust this dust. And don't worry, this is an anti-static brush. And this motherboard has Nichicon caps all over the place. That is very nice to see, especially on an early 2000s motherboard. And that battery is super dead. Now let's get those CPUs sorted. Now let's go ahead and get these card brackets back in. What these do is they support full length peripheral cards. No idea why they were taken out. So I went to reinstall the fourth fan, and I just noticed a problem with this fan configuration. They're all blowing outward. <laughs> no wonder there was so much dust in the drive bays. So it's basically pulling air from the top of the machine. Well, that's just silly. Floppy and CD drives definitely don't need that much cooling. And the power supply fan will be working against that airflow. Yeah, I don't like it. Let's configure the front fans to be the intake fans and we'll leave the back fans alone. 
Okay, this thing's ready to test, and test we shall. Let's get that DOS boot disk in there. Here we go. And we got slow beeping, which usually indicates memory failure. So let's dig into that. Gonna start by removing the PC100 stick, since it's the oddball. It shouldn't be causing a problem, but you never know. Let's see what it does now. Aha, now we're posting. And hey, that floppy drive works. And we got a CD driver. Let's see if that works. Huh, what is that? A little three inch CD of drivers, apparently. <laughs> Why was it upside down? Somebody was confused. Man, that thing's dusty. I'm gonna go straight to trying to read a CDR. Well, it spins up. Yeah, it works. Definitely sounds like a 52 speed drive. Let's see if SpeedSys can rev that up. <laughs> SpeedSys doesn't know what to do with a dual CPU. Yeah, I'd say it only tested one CPU. Well, let's hear that CD drive. That's funny, it is getting up to full speed, but SpeedSys just doesn't know it. It was at least rotating at full speed. Let's do the full test. Okay, this is taking a while. Clearly that drive works fine. Let's go ahead and try to boot Canopix. Purple? What the? Let's see if we have a bad connection or something. Yeah, we sure do. We got a DVI adapter in there. Oh lord, what is going on? That is definitely the kernel in a crash loop. Well, I guess we're not booting Nopix 9.1. That thing is profoundly unhappy. Let's see if we have better luck with Nopix 3.8. A little more period correct. And yep, two penguins means two CPUs. We still have a little hint of purple in there. It shouldn't be. I should have deoxed that DVI connector. Well, we seem to be frozen on startup. That could have something to do with the ATI video card. ATI was not very friendly to Linux back then, and the drivers we did have were pretty terrible. But hey, at least we know this system's working. All right, let's get this faceplate cleaned up. It looks like all pretty simple to remove dirt. The problem is it has all these little crevices in it. Those are gonna take a while to get into. Yeah, I'm gonna have to employ the toothbrush for this one. Well, that was tedious and time consuming, but it turned out great. It just has a few scuffs in the plastic, but what are you gonna do? And I got the inside cleaned up, looking good. I deleted that temporary Windows password sticker because it did not survive the cleaning. So I decided to look that motherboard up on eBay, check the sold listings, and apparently it's a pretty sought after board. I definitely got lucky with that one. There's definitely a lot of fun to be had with a dual Pentium 3 board. And this case is actually pretty cool. It's very unassuming, like you'd barely realize it's a computer just by looking at it. It definitely has that commercial grade look. And hey, maybe that's a mood for somebody. Let's move on to the next system. Oh, I am excited about this one. This thing looks like an absolute beast of its day. This appears to be a CAD workstation from TriStar Computer Corporation, specifically named TriCAD. And this here appears to be a defaced tape drive. And we have a pretty early CD-ROM drive here. This actually takes the CD caddies. And I do have a CD caddy, but I'm not entirely sure if it'll fit this drive, but we'll try that out later. I wouldn't be surprised if that's a SCSI drive. That three and a half inch adapter could use some assistance. And that five and a quarter inch drive is looking very TAC. That wide LED is a dead giveaway. And this case unfortunately got whacked at some point. We'll have to see if I can straighten that out. Hopefully I have time. And here's a look around the back. We can see this is an AT system and it uses the same chunky power supply type as the first system. And here's our ports and peripherals. I see we have an interesting looking sound card there. That's got me curious. And that dial up modem has a little mini DIN connector there most likely for serial communication. Not quite sure why the parallel port's labeled video. I guess things have been switched around at some point. Okay, it looks like this back panel has to come off to reveal the screws to open this thing. So let's see how that goes. That yeah, wasn't too bad. And we have a label here with a serial and phone number, but unfortunately no date of manufacture. And that very shiny label has an FCC ID. All right, let's get this thing open. Okay, let's see if the shop lights survive this one. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that one opened up a little differently. Oh yeah, we got some good stuff in here. For sure. That's a sound blaster with a SCSI interface. And I'm very pleased to see we still have the hard drive. Actually, there's two of them. And I'm very, very pleased to see it uses an external battery pack instead of a barrel battery. No corrosive board destruction here. And that's a 486DX2 board with two VLB slots, fully loaded with 72 pin SIM modules. Yeah, I'm getting excited. Okay, let's start tearing this thing down. Let me just reach my hand in that cobweb there. I'm sure that's a good idea. The tape drive uses a floppy interface. That is weird. That's an interesting arrangement for the floppy cables. One connects to the other. All right, let's see that video card. That thing's in there. There we go. And that is a VLB ATI Mach 32 with a VRAM expansion fully populated. It uses these zip chips for VRAM expansion. I am very glad to see those. From 1992. That is very nice to have. Now let's check that dial-up modem. Look at that beastly speaker. Yeah, you could really hear the handshake with that. This seems to be an Intel modem. Cool, cool. Now let's see that sound card. Oh, that is gorgeous. That is a Sound Blaster 16 CT1770. Got the SCSI connector there and a real OPL3 chip. Yeah, I am very glad to see this thing. Beautiful. And lastly, that parallel port card. Pretty basic. Seems to be from HP. Yeah, no funky creative PCB shapes from them. Basic, basic. Now, let's check out that CPU cache module. It's like a type thing I've only ever read about in books. Cache module for a 486. 256 kilobytes worth. That is very nice. And if you're wondering about the extra CPU socket, that would only be used if you had a 486SX CPU. The upgrade slot is for the 487 math coprocessor. But since this machine has a 486DX, we don't need a math coprocessor. The DX has the FPU built in. And actually, the 487 is a 486DX. It's kind of a strange situation. When you use the 487 math coprocessor, it actually takes over completely and disables the SX CPU. Yeah, I'm not quite sure why Intel did that. Now, let's check out this RAM. That's if I can even get to it. It's really awkward. Yeah, I'm gonna have to take that little speaker cage out. Ah, oh, that's better. I have a feeling we're not going to get much info looking at this RAM, other than chip part numbers. RAM manufacturers were even worse about not marking RAM in this era. And that stick is identical to the last one. And the other two look different, but identical to each other. Let's check those out. Gold Star. Let's check out the last one. Yep, definitely identical. Well, at least we kind of match. Okay, let's get the CMOS battery out of here. Because there's no chance it has any life left. These are usually just Velcroed on. There we go. And we might as well get this serial and parallel port disconnected. Now let's get that power supply disconnected. And here's a good shot of that motherboard. It's a Micronix 09-00144 Gemini board, revision A1. I'll have to check if this BIOS version already exists on the retro web. If not, we'll dump it and get it uploaded. And this would have been a pretty nice board to have at the time, with VLB, onboard IDE, and a slot for a cache module. I definitely would have been happy with it. And as for the battery, I'm just going to use a regular old CR2032 for now. And that is nowhere near the ideal battery for this, but it's what I have on hand. And it'll work just fine for testing. However, for replacing these 4.5 volt packs, all you need is three double or triple A batteries. Just put those in a series battery holder, and they'll work fine. And that's probably the long-term solution I'll use for this system. I just don't have any such battery holders on hand. The CR2032 will have to do. Okay, let's pull that hard drive cage. It looks like a single screw holds it in, unless there's one hiding from me. Nope, that's it. Nice. <laughs> oh, that is a thick drive. That's as thick as that Toshiba that we looked at in the first system. Hopefully it doesn't have mostly bad sectors. 
Okay, let's pull the rest of these drives. And here's a look at the thick hard drive. It is a Maxtor LXT340A. There's no indicator of capacity, but Googly says it's a 340 megabyte drive. It is IDE, of course. And here's a good look at the logic board. This drive could be from the very late 80s or early 90s. And the other hard drive is also a Maxtor. Model 7546AT. Seems to be a 546 megabyte drive. Manufactured July 10th, 1994. And here's a look at that logic board. And what on earth is that? They got a little dog in the silk screen there. <laughs> That's funny. Who knew Maxtor was so playful? And here's that scuzzy old CD drive. Manufactured by Toshiba. Model XM-3401B. Manufactured May 1994. And luckily both terminating resistor packs are in place. And just look at the construction of this thing. It is all cast aluminum. There is no sheet metal anywhere. This thing's rugged. And here's a look at that tape drive. Made by Colorado Memory Systems. On August 5th, 1992. I'm guessing it's a 250 megabyte drive. And despite missing its face, it's actually in pretty good condition. Spindle motor is still spindly. I just find it awfully strange that they were using the floppy drive interface. Most tape drives would have been scuzzy or something. I would love to see how that works, but I only have DDS3 tapes and I don't think those will work in this. The head is a little bit worn, but the roller is not perished. I feel like this drive would probably work, though I honestly have no idea what these are supposed to look like inside. There could be something very important missing. And that five and a quarter inch drive is indeed made by TIAC. I'd know that face anywhere. TIAC FD55GFR to be exact. No trouble out of that spindle. This thing is really dusty though. I'm gonna go ahead and give it some service. And that three and a half inch drive is also a TIAC. Hooray for twinsies. That's an FD235HF. The spinny part is spinny. And actually really clean in here. Doesn't even really need to be swept out. And here's something I forgot to point out on the first system. These drives have a little rotational damper here. And it seems to be for smoothing out the action of inserting and ejecting discs. See it has a little pinion there that runs against it. It also has the effect of softening the head dropping down on the disc. TIAC cares about your discs. And that appears to be a pretty decent power supply. However, it is old, so we're gonna have to put it through its paces. Looks like it can handle about 100 watts on the 12 volt rail. So let's stress this thing out. And of course, we gotta watch the inside while we do that. Those are some interesting dust formations there. Let's knock that off. If there's gonna be a fire, we want less tinder, not more. Okay, we'll be nice and hit this thing with only a single 60 watt light bulb. Let's see what it does. Hmm, that's not looking good. It's dragging the 12 volt rail all the way down to nine volts. And because of that, the sacrificial hard drives can't start. Let's try just disconnecting that bulb. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, that power supply is pretty weak. I'll just give it some time to suffer, even though I'm definitely not using it. I'm not putting this much cool hardware at risk. Oh, but I wanna see this thing suffer. I'm plugging that bulb back in. Oh, that trips the short circuit protection. Let's see if I restart it. Yep, starts back up, same behavior. Look how whacked out the five volt rail is too. Okay, well nothing catastrophic's happening. And we're not seeing the voltage fall off like we did in that very cheap power supply. Oh well, either way, I'm not using this one. Too sketchy. Okay, so this one might actually be a repair candidate. The behavior of the five volt rail seems to suggest that something's out of spec on this. And that would be cool to explore just for funsies. And I'm also awfully low on power supplies in this form factor. So I had to borrow the new old stock JDR power supply from System 1. Oh well. Alright, time to see what it does. I really hope those hard drives work. Let's find out. And we're posting. Both drives sound happy enough. Invalid configuration, no surprise. Hmm, floppy drives aren't happy. I'm pretty sure I don't have the cables flipped. Usually the LEDs stay on when that's happening. Unless maybe that tape drive has things deeply confused. Well, let's run setup. Maybe they're just misconfigured. Yep, we know that. So drive A should be the five and a quarter inch drive. So we'll set that to the 3.5 inch. There it is. 
Now it's interesting that it has parameters for the hard drive. That battery was definitely dead. Okay, so this BIOS does have an auto config option. Well, let's see what this gets us. Okay, now those drives are seeking. Ooh, but that thing is unhappy. Okay, I guess those hard drives probably don't support auto detection. Okay, I guess we'll try user config then. Let's see how that goes. Okay, well, we're getting somewhere. There seems to be a damaged DOS 5 install on that hard drive. However, the hard drive must be at least partially working in order to get that message. Okay, well, I have no such diskette, so let's try just booting it up from floppy. Okay, cool, that floppy drive works. Uh, apparently this is IBM DOS. Forgot I had this on here. <laughs> well, let's see if we have C drive. And we do. And we do have stuff on here. Internet Explorer. This thing must have some flavor of Windows on it. I wonder why the DOS install is corrupted. Let's see if we detected that other hard drive. Yes, we did. And that one seems to be working too. Let's see, I don't think I have very much in the way of utilities on this disk. Nope. And scan disk definitely won't run on IBM DOS. Okay, I need to go make a DOS 62 boot disk. One moment. And obviously no IDE driver for our SCSI CD-ROM drive. But we already knew that. I want to see if there's any obvious corruption on that C drive that's stopping DOS 5 from booting. So let's see what ScanDisk thinks. Okay, the file structure is clean. I wonder what happened to that DOS install. It was clearly being used. You know what, let's do a surface scan. Okay, yeah, that drive is clean. So something else took out that DOS install. Well, let's go back in the C drive. That is definitely a well-used DOS install. It even has Windows on it. I am just dying to know what they were using on this system. First off, let's see what's in the auto exec bat. Okay, that's pretty normal. It's odd there's not an entry to start Windows. Now I saw an auto exec dot old, so let's see what's in there. No, that's exactly the same. Okay, that's weird. Let's see if that Windows directory even has anything in it. Yeah, it sure does. Looks like things are missing though. Hmm, those date stamps are kind of weird. That definitely wasn't installed in 1980. Obviously, you could set the date to whatever you want, but to me, this indicates shenanigans. There may not be any saving this DOS install. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's see if that three and a half inch drive works. Okay, that's seeming like a no. It's also making some very strange sounds. Let's give it another try. Yeah, that drive's having issues. I don't know if it's audible on the microphone, but it sounds like it's struggling to get up to speed. Well, that's too bad. Okay, I decided it's too much to try to save that DOS install. There's just not enough time this week. But I do want to know if that CD-ROM drive works. So we're going to need something with a SCSI driver. A Win9X boot disk should have what we need. At least I'm about 90% sure that it does. Oh, and I swapped in a working 3.5 inch floppy drive. Yes, we do want to start with CD-ROM support. Alright, that SCSI drive's detected. And it got assigned the drive letter. Looking good so far. Now, gather round, kids. I'm going to show you how we used CD-ROMs in the olden days. We didn't use disk trays. We used caddies. And these opened up by squeezing these two tabs together and lifting up on this plastic. Then you'd put your CD inside of there. And then close it. Then you just open up the drive, and then insert the caddy. <laughs> and the idea was you could buy caddies for each one of your discs, and if you use those for storage then you'd never have to touch your discs, which would supposedly help protect them from damage, or some such nonsense. Okay, let's see if that thing works. And yes it does! <laughs> that is awesome! 
that drive being as old as it is. All right, you got a working caddy based CD ROM drive. And this is how they eject. <laughs> it's like a giant floppy disk. And here's what the underside of the caddy looks like. This metal shield slides to the side to reveal the data. Okay, so I guess all we have left to do is to check out the second hard drive. Okay, no trouble on that drive either. Wow, two healthy Max Tours. I'm impressed. I'm still a little bit miffed that I can't run the original OS. Let's see what's in that tape directory. Okay, it's empty. How about that SCSI directory? Okay, that's also empty. Maybe this file system got wrecked at some point. I don't really recognize any of these other programs, except for Lotus, of course. Oh well. Well, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to attempt any plastic repairs. I'm just completely out of time this week. This whole case honestly looks a little bit tweaked. I think there's some metal damage. I think this case might have fallen over at some point. So yeah, it turns out there was plenty of reason to be excited about this one. This system is just full of gems. VLB 486, Sound Blaster with SCSI, a VLB ATI Mach 32, two surviving Max tours. Yeah, there's a lot to love in this one. Hopefully I can get that case damage straightened out. If not, all those great parts will easily find new homes. Well, these yielded even better components than I thought. Full-size towers tend to do that. Just full of treasures. The fine people on Patreon are also treasures. Thank you all for helping to keep this show going. And if you're new here and you like this kind of thing, I have quite a few of these videos now. And I have a lot more coming, so be sure to subscribe. But that's all for this video. See you in the next one.